Yeah, yeah. Right there. yeah. last spot. Well done, Rob. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Eric, I'll let you introduce your panel. Take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So um, hello, everyone. Everyone, for being out very late last night, you guys look great. So congratulations on that for surviving yet another day. So we're going to talk about uh, social search engine optimization and, and what some are calling search 3.0. And uh, we're going to do introductions in a minute here. But I'll, I'm going to start with a, a short story. So about an hour ago, my phone rings, and I, I was sitting at this front table, and I had to leave the room to take the call because it was from ADT. Does anybody have ADT here, some kind of security system? Right? So, you know, you rarely get these calls, and I got this call, and, and it was uh, them saying that there, a panic button had been pushed in my house. I didn't even know I had a panic button. But this thing went off, and they called me, and they wanted to know what I should do. And so I immediately you know, said, listen, don't send the police out yet. Let me get a hold of my wife. And I started to reach out. I, you know, I called her. I sent her a text message. I tweet her. I go on Facebook and send them. I mean, I'm going nuts outside just trying to get a hold of her. And I get nothing back. And I, I'm, I'm honestly panicking. And so I call ADT back and I said, send out a cruiser. And, you know, then I'm, you know, I'm thinking Chicago, they don't send out cruisers for this. You got to get, you know, stabbed in the throat, you know, and there's got to be blood on the tracks for them to come out. So I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out and I'm going back and forth and trying to get a hold. And finally, just a little bit ago, I got a message back from my my wife saying that she's okay, which, you know, was, I, I couldn't have done this session if I wouldn't have gotten that message. But my guess, the thing that I learned today is none of this shit works if you've got it turned off, and that's exactly what she had. She was in a train, she was studying, she was getting ready for uh, a presentation she had today, and she had everything turned off so she could focus. And here I was using about 18 different technologies, uh, some of them social media, to try to get a hold of her, and I got nothing. So it's almost like we've become, so our expectations are so high of this stuff that when it doesn't work or we don't get something back, um, you know, it throws us into a little bit of a panic. So, so which one did she respond to? She ended up being the text message, and then she called me immediately after. So the te text, texting wins in this one. So anyway, thought I'd share that with you as we, we get open here. I'm Eric Papson. I'm the U.S. President of Performix. Performix, if you don't know about us, we're uh, a uh, performance uh, uh, marketing uh, agency that's based in Chicago, but we've got uh, 26 offices in 35, uh, or I should say 35 offices in 26 countries. We do things like paid search, SEO, uh, performance display, and social media. Uh, conversion optimization, content strategies, mobile, really everything that kind of, you know, completes the circuit uh, in performance marketing. So happy to be your moderator today. I'm going to have our, our, our great panelists here go down the line and introduce themselves. So I'm uh, Kevin Lee, uh, founder and CEO of Did It. Uh, Did It's been in the search space for 17 years. Uh, clearly we've morphed many times over the 17 years, but uh, we're sort of still a hybrid between a technology company and an agency. We, we, we find technology solutions that stand on their own and then we manage a lot of paid search and our clients badgered us into getting into earned media social uh, as well so now we do that and display too. Got a very short, maybe this was made for Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm Bryson Meunier, I'm the director of SEO strategy for Resolution Media. Um, Resolution Media, if you don't know us, we're Omnicom's only dedicated uh, search agency. Uh, we've been around since 2003, and we do a lot of the same stuff that, that Performix uh, does. Um, I, I am the director of SEO strategy, which means that I uh, help build the SEO product at Resolution, and now really you know, dictate with our top clients uh, what the strategy should be going forward. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Simmons, and I'm the director of SEO and social product at the search agency. And uh, we do everything they do better uh, <laughs> and more expensive, uh, and please use us. All right, so uh, uh, just as an idea, I didn't do the voiceover for the Geico Gecko, just in case people were wondering. It's and uncanny, I've, though, I know, how close it is. And I've never met the queen, and uh, <laughs> well, I don't watch Downton Abbey. All right, apart from that, I do SEO, uh, and hopefully we're going to have a good time up here. 
And of course, I get to follow Grant. <laughs> I'm Derek Tucker. I'm with Corel. Corel is a uh, top 10 packaged goods software company. We operate 34 global stores. We've been around since 84. We own products like Corel Draw, WinZip, the Roxio Pinnacle lines, Photoshop, uh, quite a number of them. I run the global uh, program for digital digital marketing. That uh, anything really paid ultimately throws flows through me or through a person on my team. So here's here's uh, how we're going to set this up today. So we're I'm going to ask a number of questions over the next you know 35 minutes or so. We're going to we're going to start with kind of just in kind of talking about this space a bit. You know what is it? I'm going to ask the panel to define it, and we're going to just kind of get an understanding of what we're talking about here. We're going to then get into the how. How does this change things? And lastly, we're going to talk about the future. Where is this going? What does this mean for us three, four, five years from now? And we got together. We were watching the, all the panels yesterday, and I. I one of the things I notice is that the, the panels are always kind of competing, you know, against the devices that are in front of you, right? So we're talking about uh, social and search, and literally you guys are doing it as we're talking about it. So one of the things we thought to kind of keep it interesting is uh, to kind of uh, welcome debate, right? And so we got together yesterday with drinks in hand, and we said, you know, how do you guys feel about that? And then the, the panel immediately started to argue with one another about how we should go about this. And I thought, this is the perfect group of people to do this. So we're going to, we're going to be okay with the why. We're going to question one another and be comfortable with it. Don't get nervous. You know, we've, we're, uh, we're, we're all trying to do this to kind of provide another perspective, a devil's advocate view at sometimes. Sometimes some of the things you hear now, uh, hear from the panel might not be their point of view, but just a, a kind of helping us understand the other arguments that are out there, perspectives. Sound good? All right, let's get started. So I'm going to ask the panel, just start with kind of your definition of social search engine optimization and search 3.0. How do you define it? Kevin? Um, I define it in a way that, that we, we're moving from the information economy, where information is published in some readable form, to an economy of who knows what, right? And, and it's not there yet, but uh, when I was sort of thinking about this, this kind of a panel, this kind of discussion, uh, and I was thinking about graph search and knowledge graphs, um, the sort of epiphany for me was, okay, sometimes for a lot of things where we need help during a decision process on a commercial decision we're making about a product or a brand or uh, which retailer to choose, you know, we're in a very influenceable, we're, we're open to influence and often we rely on information that's in somebody's brain that they haven't actually dumped onto paper, they haven't shot a video on it, they haven't, it's just sitting in their brain. And to the extent that, that social media allows some third party entity to unlock the, that value and to know and predict that there's somebody that I know or somebody that knows somebody I know who would be able to help me in making, you know, potentially a very, you know, a difficult decision or choice about a product, whether it's a new Lenovo laptop or, or, or anything, um, that that's really the power behind this intersection of social and search. And that at some point, assuming that a few catalysts are in place, we'll be able to unlock that, that power because especially when you're going to spend, you know, over a thousand dollars on something, whether that's a vacation or a computer or whatever, and it's a complex decision making process, the information that is still locked up in people's brains is, is really almost considerably more valuable than the information that's already been pumped out into the, you know, trillions of pages on the web. And, and, and I wanted to sort of, you know, think through that and think, th where is it now and where could it be going? Yeah, and, and Bryson, do you agree with that or what would you add? You know, um, for, I, I, I agree with it. Uh, I think that it's, you know, um, that that social is something that, that Google has always had things that they've never really ac accounted for in search. And so when it comes to search results, we really haven't um, seen you know, social authority uh, the way that we are starting to see it now and we'll definitely see it when you know, what um, Eric Schmidt uh, uh, when he was talking about authority in search results, you know, he said the, um, the consequence of uh, not adopting uh, author rank is invisibility. You know, I think that um, that's really going to, it's getting to the point where 
social is uh, not only uh, social has always been a part of search. You know, links are social, but to the point where it's getting to the point where we have so many other inputs, and Google, you know, is really starting to uh, index and account for a lot of those things in their uh, in their search ranking. So, um, you know, for me to answer your original question, Eric. Social search is just the next evolution of search engine optimization. You know, it's always been about um, links, mm -hmm. you know, and links are social, but now we're starting to account for the social networks that people are using. I don't think that it's, you know, I think that the search engines have a long way to go before they, um, you know, before they can do it in a way that's going to be useful to the majority of consumers. I think that there's still a lot of noise in social search. Um, but yeah, I think um, you know th there have always been signals that Google just really did not, you know, pay attention to. To, to Kevin's yeah. point, and now they're really starting to incorporate more of those. Grant, what are we missing in this definition? Well, simplicity, probably. Um, my way of thinking of it <laughs> is it's word of mouth, word of mouth amplified and indexed, though it can be found. And I think that's what social search is all about. Whether it's on another platform, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I mean, when, when I look out at these folks here, and they, most of them are on their devices, I mean, how many people here right now are live tweeting what we're doing? Thank you so much for not doing that. Right. How many of you guys were on Facebook checking out someone that you went to school with? Now, how many people are on LinkedIn connecting with someone from the conference? All right. So basically, no one's actually social here. So you're missing the point a little bit, guys, all right? Look, the ultimate thing is, it's just about the conversations you have day in, day out, and just looking at how that's amplified by technology, and then the fact that I can search on it. That's the key thing. So, so Derek, I mean, we've got agency, 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 agency here, and now a brand at Corral down there. I mean, help us out here. What are we missing? Platitude, platitude, platitude. <laughs> <laughs> I come from the brand side, and as a brand, you're probably a bit more cynical. And you know, absolutely, the things that I read, whether it be on, on Search Engine Watch or whether it be on ClickZ, the statements that I hear are very lack the relative nature of, of, of social. And I and I think back. I mean, I've done direct response on Facebook, and and uh, you know. I've, I spent a fair bit of money and I could contribute exactly 0.15% of my revenue over the last five clicks attributed back to Facebook. The simple reality is people go to Facebook to do something. And to kind of believe that you can bring that into Google search in all cases for all products in all situations is just an absolute platitude. You know, I, I believe there's a place for it. Customer reviews. First thing I do if I go on a holiday. What are the customer reviews? If I buy a, a piece of software or I buy a, uh, a new piece of hardware, a new camera, I go and I look at the customer reviews. Do I give a damn what my friends think about the camera? No, I care about what all those customer reviews sure. are. Okay. Now, there are other situations where I'm looking for a restaurant. You know, I want to go on Yelp. I want to find that information. So everything is contextual to the situation. And to kind of brush this one stream across and say, you know, social is the absolute future of search is a bit mis of a misnomer simply because it's all situational. Yeah, thoughts on that. Go ahead, jump well, in. Well, I, I was, I was going to actually uh, agree. Platitude is a wonderful thing. Well done. Thank you. No, I mean, how many people actually trust their friends? I don't. I mean, <laughs> you know, if I'm looking for a camera, I'm not going to go to the guy that takes snaps of his kids. They all look the same, Tony O'Reilly. I mean, you know, <laughs> sorry. But I mean, it's tough, and we were trusting strangers just because it's visible. So I, I'm agreeing with that stuff, but yeah. Well, you talk about trust, and, and, and this is one that, that I've been thinking about recently. It's just about game in the system. I mean, we all know with Panda and, and backlinks and how things have gone and how Google has really come out and to some degree punished the, the transgressors. I can go out and I can buy fans. I can go buy plus ones. So exactly what indication is it the number of fans that I have or the number of plus ones, if I can control that, eventually Google will realize that's not a really good indicator. Yeah. And at some point, it's going to come full circle and come back to us. So how much time do I want to invest building that base out for, for Google? I'd rather do something much more direct that I know at this point I can quantify and I could take to the bottom line and I get my bonus check at the end of the month. Yeah, and I, I think that Google has already started to realize that people are, are spamming uh, 
plus ones and likes. And um, you know, Google and Bing, uh, I've seen them do presentations where they're actually showing the uh, the networks and spammy networks versus organic networks. And so it, it's really just you know a lot of it, as I was saying before, it's the same thing that they've started to do that they've been doing for links for years has just kind of um, you know become a part of this uh, social world. But I, I totally agree with you that um, you know to some extent, uh, and I trust certain friends, but I think that you, some of my friends are family members. Like, you know, if I'm doing a search on uh, Google for uh, new music and, um, you know, I'm connected to my Aunt Barb, and I love my Aunt Barb, but I don't give a damn what she says about music, you know? On the other hand, if I'm connected to, like, Pitchfork Media or the Chicago Symphony, then that actually matters to me. So I think it, it's the search engines need to get better with making those connections. And I think Google Plus, you know, even more than Facebook, has that opportunity to really um, take advantage of those circles. And the, the circles that, they, that uh, users will put other people in in order to determine what's relevant. Because I think that's really what's going to uh, cut down on the noise that currently exists with social, social search. What, what the search engines or the social media organizations, whichever one of them sort of cracks it, is going to be in a really great position to do. But the problem is, is that right now there's not an economic scheme in place to fill the data vacuum. Right? Because the reality is, 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 you know, we just asked if anybody's doing anything social right now, and they're not, right? So the data, the, the, the data room is empty, uh, or pretty much empty. But there's a lot of behaviors that probably are occurring that still tell somebody, some organization, what people are likely to know and where they're likely to be in a position of influence with regards to you know, helping out the ecosystem. Right? The problem is, is right now there's no way for those individuals uh, to, to contrib for that information to make its way into an algorithm, right? So you know, I may spend a lot of time on you know, Thai recipe sites, and so maybe I'm a really great Thai cook. And I never write about that, I never blog about that, I rarely tweet about that, right? So it's really, it's, it's in, not in the data set. But, the publishers know, right, and, and even a lot of the social media organizations know, but they haven't figured out a way, like Facebook is not compensating the recipe sites for the fact that, that, that Facebook knows that I like Thai cooking, right, so the data just doesn't get used, right, because there's no economic structure. Similarly, you know, I may be really knowledgeable in DSLR cameras because I may be a prosumer type hobbyist, but again, there's a lot of data that would indicate that I'm probably really knowledgeable on that, but it sort of belongs to somebody else. So the only way that that data can make it into some kind of an algorithm is for there to be an economic structure that facilitates it. And that's sort of the catalyst that's missing, right? Because there is, there is, is a lot of untapped information. It's just that nobody's figured out the business model yet, right? So eventually a Lenovo is going to be really, really interested in the same way that they're interested now in influencing like top bloggers in the tech space, and it's a sort of a PR initiative, like they can identify those top bloggers. They can even do a, a, a Twitter firehose analysis and identify really influential people within the, within the Twitter sphere, right, with regards to talking about tech. But it's just, it, there's, there hasn't yet been sort of an economic model on top of it, that, that, that moves it into the paid media ecosystem. And I think it's going to be fascinating to sort of watch that. You know, what, what's the various uh, carrots and sticks that get placed into there, right? Is it going to be Google essentially bribing either publishers and individuals to sort of make that information available to Google Plus, right? Either, because uh, you can get it either way. You can either have the individual sort of contribute that knowledge by install a browser plugin, right, in Chrome or Firefox or IE, or do I get the information from the publishers? Um, isn't, I mean, isn't the SERP real estate kind of the reward here? And if that's the case, I mean, this goes back to SEO and, you know, Google told us it's just about content. We weren't satisfied with that, so we went out and tried to reverse engineer the algorithm. I mean, if the SERP is, is really the reward here for not only the brand, but the marketers that are out there representing them, then uh, isn't it about you know, kind of finding more ways to engage those brands, kind of moving those participants to engage and, and share and like and, and, you know, and all of the behaviors that they would do to kind of help send the right signals or not. 
<laughs> well, I learned I learned that Kevin photographs Thai food. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to work out. It. No, I mean, well, look, I don't actually. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, <laughs> theoretically. Right. Well, look, um, I think that there's always solutions that are, are looking for problems, and like Facebook graph search is one of those things. Um, you know, talking about how you tie all the data together of my behaviour. Uh, it's not really good when not everyone is contributing to the mix. It's the big data holes you're talking about. And I think with, uh, with social data, which leads to the social search component, what's indexed and what can be found, um, there's challenges with people actually giving up what they do. And we're talking about this at the table the other day, about how, you know, Bing's trying to get more information and Google's supposed to tell you more information. It's a challenge, because you can only search against stuff you have. And so the next 3.0 social search is getting people to contribute more or involuntarily steal it when they're not looking. And I think that that's, the, that's probably the key. But, but, but I think Eric has a very valid point in that in the end we, we, we come from, we think of things, we think of the SERP as the highly valuable screen real estate and it may not be a Google SERP in the future, maybe a Facebook graph search SERP if people ever actually use it, but some kind of a SERP, right? So from that perspective I think as marketers, we have to broaden our horizons, right? And think about, okay, who's going to end up showing up in these SERPs, right? And what's going to end up showing up in these SERPs? And if, if there's enough scale behind some of these things that are going to be showing up in the SERPs, how do, I, how do I influence that, right, as a marketer, right? So if, if it ends up that, there's, that, that Gary Vanderchuk is going to end up being influential in the wine community just because he happens to be like a total social media guru and was like the first to start talking about wine and most wine snobs probably think Gary Vanderchuk really doesn't know all that much about wine but who cares if he's the influencer in the wine community right then as a wine producer I gotta figure out how to get on Gary's radar right because he's showing up in in the Google SERP as the wine and the, the guy about wine, right? So we have to think if we're going to do any top funnel marketing at all within the social search ecosystem, it ends up being about these influencers, right? Who are these influencers for that very specific segment that we're in? Because there's different influencers for wine than it is for tablet computers. So let's stay with that theme. Derek, I mean, uh, as you know, your brand Corel, I mean, what are you doing about this? What are you guys, what's your strategy? Well, it's interesting because I keep hearing social search. I keep hearing SERP. But, you know, I talked to Lemon over at, at Omniture. I've talked to Laura over at William Sonoma, Margo, uh, over at Revolve Clothing. Every single one of us has the same issue, which is none of us control social. We all control search. We have almost no influence within our own organizations. There's always this sort of statement that comes out that marketing is one big homogenous family. It's not. There are divisions, there are silos, and, there, and there's this constant. You're, you're always trying to push your area. So if you control search, the reality is you actually have very little influence in most organizations, most large companies, to direct how social goes. Now, as Google goes and they, and they start pulling information, it will appear on the SERP. It will come in. But to kind of believe that most brand people have a strong influence on social and can guide both simultaneously is a bit of a falsity. It's a, it so I want to say it's a fascinating topic, I think, Derek, and because what we saw in S for the SEOs up here, which are, I think, most of us, you know, we saw SEO really bring together IT and marketing for the first time. I remember, you know, this still happens today. We will we'll have a meeting and for the first time, you know, Susie from IT will be meeting Bob, you know, from, you know, on, on the, you know, direct response or search side and they had never met each other in new organizations. And, and so the PR guys as well. Yeah, PR. As I mean, well, yeah. so we, you know, SEO became this way to unite the organization around a one goal, yeah. right, which was getting into the SERP you know, are getting that content visible. Is this an opportunity, Derek, to do the same thing now with, with social and PR and some of the other, other aspects of the organization that haven't unified? I actually think that the unifying force for most organizations will ultimately be the analytics side, mm. the attribution side. As Marcom, in my mind, I have two very clear definitions, or three segments for social media. I've got the Marcom, which is the traditional PR side, and these are the people that, that control and they, and, they, and they drive forward with the Facebooks and the, and the Twitter accounts and they, and they do the day-to-day -day postings. Then you've got the direct response side, which oftentimes does belong to the e-commerce team and is, is really about driving a trial or a direct action. And then you've got a customer service side of the business. But underlying all of that is the analytics side. And as 
more companies delve deeper into attribution and they see how things click through, I think there will become more pressure uh, for accountability for the social media side, the traditional Marcom side of the business. And as they see their budgets maybe begin to tighten, as money is maybe shifted away from there, I think that there's a natural self-preservation that's going to kick in. And they're going to start looking towards, how can I help SERP? How can I come back? I mean, I think Kevin mentioned yesterday, there's a 5 to 10% higher click-through rate when an ad on the SERP actually has Google Plus enabled. Um, so there's a, there's a tangible benefit that you can actually quantify, that you can actually turn into a number that ultimately comes back to justify the expense of running the social media. So I think ultimately analytics attribution is going to be that unifying force that brings them together. So you know the brands are in, in the brands are you know apparently huddling up you know after these <laughs> sessions at lunch and on horseback on the beach and talking amongst themselves. Good for you guys at the spa. Yeah, and you've all you've all agreed that the problem is a similar problem around you know how do you how do you kind of uh, the change management of this unification the alignment of this within organizations agencies are paid to solve problems and I turn to my agency you know friends here and say you know what's your role in all of this in your opinion if these are the challenges the brands are you having. know it, it's probably like it was in SEO and paid search which is um, a brand or, or retailer needed to get its lunch eaten right before the internal structures changed Right, and, and, and people started to cooperate internally. It, it's sort of like it, it really needed to hit the fan to the point where you couldn't argue that it was hitting the fan. It's like, whoa, we're covered in it. I think we have a problem. And then all of a sudden, like somebody at a senior enough level would, would reorg or force committees or whatever. And it wouldn't necessarily always fully solve the problem, but it would at least get the, the conversation started. But the, you know, there's a tremendous amount of inertia. And I think our role as agencies is to sort of gently point out, like, you know, it hasn't hit the fan yet, but it's, it's the projectile is about to hit the fan, and you may want to, you know, put on rain gear because you know I know you're probably not going to be able to change in time before it hits the fan but here are some ideas you may want to think about you may want to think more holistically you may want to get you know the data warehouses in place to start looking at the data to, so that you can at least say what the F happened right when it hits the fan and, and not be put out of business um, by some some kind of a shift in the ecosystem because it's you know, search changes really fast, and you know, having a little bit of of, of forethought and and putting in place the the structures. I think agencies we can be the change agents, or at least the gentle suggestors externally to to facilitate that. Bryson, uh, Kevin says winter is coming for the brands and, and kind of create a sense of urgency. What, what's your uh, point of view on this? You no, know, you know, I agree that that we do have to make those gentle suggestions, but I think you have to kind of. Uh, prime your clients and you have to get the clients that really, you know, uh, understand that winter is coming from the forefront so that you don't have to continue to, um, you know, avoid that disaster, but you can make uh, proactive uh, judgments about the future. You know, we're, we're really um, focused on targeting tomorrow at Resolution Media and we really want to make sure that, you know, our clients understand what it takes to uh, not just succeed today but in the future. And I think when you have clients that are receptive to that, then it, then it makes it easier. You know, then you're not always, uh, then, then you're going to be prepared for winter and you're going to be, um, you know, uh, in your snowshoes today. Thanks for staying with that. So, and Grant, Grant I want to, so this, this is a big, like, okay, everyone, I'm, if I was sitting out there, it'd be like, okay, so what do we do about this, right? So we hear organizational kind of challenges, we hear an ever-evolving SERP, we hear social signals, and it's a debate on which ones are actually influencing uh, search engine rankings, uh, you know, all of this about participant kind of marketing. What, what, what does someone in the audience do tomorrow to start addressing this? Hey, Grant, before you answer, just let me give you some context of some thoughts from the the Twitter screen there from some of the audience. One, somebody out here thinks you have a very dreamy voice, just so you know. <laughs> thank, um, you. Thank, thank you very much. It, thank I'm you. enjoying it myself, so maybe we can hang out later. I'm actually uh, from uh, New York. It's fine. <laughs> um, no, a couple of the questions in here was, to take the Game of Thrones sort of analogy further, if there's no one true king in social, who should own that social? And another person in the audience has asked that for all this uh, strategic pontification we're doing, 
if you guys have any real tactical examples of what we do with all of this. So just to give you some context to that answer. Well, I, I, let me do the, f the first one is what do we do? Look, we're brought in as the quarterback a lot of the time to settle internal struggles and we can either do that well or not. I was talking to a guy from HSN this morning and I said, I posed the question, you know, do you want to rank number one for something that no one searches for? Hello. And the answer is if your boss says yes, you know. And, and that's the thing, you've got to have buy-in internally from the boss that the PR guys and the marketing guys and the tech guys are going to get in the same, same room and play nice, you know? Because Marcom thinks there's no problems because they think they're wonderful. Tech guys think there's no problems because they own the website. And PR people, they're promoting that there's no problems in the company. <laughs> so um, I think that's the key. But the actual tactical thing is, you know, leverage your agency as that, that quarterback and the Henry Kissinger of making sure everyone's talking together. That's the biggest thing that probably ties into that. We've done it with big brands and we've failed in some brands just because we don't have the buy-in. That's being honest and transparent. If you don't have people that want to do it, they're never going to do it. So we try and we, we succeed a lot of the time. So, uh, you know, and a huge part, part of that and, and it, was, it was great that Derek brought that up, but let's, let's talk about tangible things we can do, you know, starting tomorrow. How does our SEO strategy change? as a result of what's going on now with social search. How does our content strategies change? How do we engage participants or an audience in a different way tomorrow as a result of all of this, all of this change that's going on? What are some of the things that you guys are recommending to your clients? Or Derek, what are the things that you're doing with, you know, with your brand right now and your content strategy or the rest of it that's, that is in line with this? I mean, in in the short term, right, you know, just using what we already know absolutely works is we know that there's a direct correlation between high levels of social activity and the generation of links which are sort of link bait type links, right? And that given the fact that, that on an SEO basis, the, the, the still it remains the largest single factor of relevance ranking within the engines is the link voting algorithms. And then they're supplemented by social signals and user experience signals and all these other validation signals. So, you know, there's a great reason to, to invest in the social side of things, even though graph search is not working right and the knowledge graph is sort of not quite ready for prime time yet. There's a reason to invest now. Right? And we've seen that, that the clients who've started to invest in this and sort of take a more holistic approach to sort of the intersection between, hey, you know, I just go out and I get links that are not paid links, right? I'm trying to do the, the earned media side of things. You know, that they actually reap the benefits. There's a, a lag time, could be six months, could be a year, but that investment pays out. Right, so that's something that, you know, there's case study after case study, you know, often people don't want to share the specifics because it's sort of like their secret sauce, but it works. Yeah. What I think what works uh, and what everybody should be doing now, I think a lot of people uh, poo-poo uh, Google Plus, and Google Plus is something that, you know, is uh, there's a direct correlation between being added to a circle and ranking, uh, personalized ranking. So this is something that, you know, brands can take advantage of e easily. I think a, a lot of the clients that, some of the clients that we work with are uh, reluctant to you know, share Google Plus because they're really not as active on Google Plus. But if you have a strategy where you are actually sharing content that's related to the keywords that you're trying to rank for, uh, and you have people adding you to their circles, these are people that are you know generally going to they're going to be brand loyal anyway. They're going to share to their circles, and this thing is going to to grow uh, not just for you know a single set of search results as has been you know the history of SEO, but for personalized search across Google. So I think... So, uh, uh, Bryson, given that, one of the, the tweets up here was asking if uh, Google Plus buttons on the pages helps rank better. So clearly you would think that that's going to help? So if you have, uh, not necessarily if you've plus one something, although Google will say, you know, this person is plus one something. But if you add someone to your circle, you're going to you're go you are going to rank better. Um, you know, it may just be by two or three spots, but if you are below the fold and you're two or three spots higher, you're going to get more visibility as a result of that. Grant, and then Grant, to, to get my boss to do that, do I have to have dragons? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. All right. Uh, so, uh, for completely forgot what I was talking about. Oh, all right. Okay. So, uh, tomorrow, I have answering this question. I have an article coming out in Search Engine Watch 
and with a, a hat tip to Unmarketing Scott Stratton. It's called Awesome Fricking Content. And I think if there's one thing that gels everything together in a company, it's the ability and the understanding of what awesome freaking content is and how that's going to help from a social standpoint, from a link standpoint, from a visibility standpoint, engagement, authority, positioning, create awesome freaking content in your organization, get everyone to rally around that, and you can succeed from a social search standpoint because it gets better visibility, better signals, better plus ones and everything we're talking about here. But you've got to have great content. It doesn't, hurt. It doesn't work. And great content is relevant. But so if, if, oh yeah. No, well, do you do you actually say in this article what awesome freaking content is? Because There's actually 11 points to awesome freaking content, but okay. yes. But I mean, it ties into His, everything. Your you article know. goes to 11. 11. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, yeah. It and was going to sure be like five, and then it kept going. I mean, it, it, it make sure you put that in the title, because you know any list gets retweeted twice yeah, as often no. as a non-list title. But yeah. I think to, to Derek's earlier point about the challenges that, that marketers face, right, organizationally and breaking down the silos, I think there's at least as much inertia and internal resistance relating back to the Twitter question of who's going to own this, right? Because whether the agencies are independent or part of holding companies, there's a huge P&L fight, right? Who wants to own this revenue stream at the agency level, right? And so the who, who should own it question is, is being debated. You know, every agency thinks they should own it, right? The PR agencies say, well, social is really just like earned media PR, so we should own that. And of course, the search agencies say, no, 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 you don't understand. Look at the SERP. It's so heavily influenced by social. We should own it. And, and so... They're, you know, they, each of them has the ear of somebody at the client side, right? Whether it's the, 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 the doers or the thinkers or the delegators, right? They're all hearing it from their agency. And so, you know, I don't know how it's all going to shake out because there's probably no, no one true answer. But you've got sort of agency side politics either within holding companies or within and outside holding companies as well as client side politics. I mean, you guys hear it all the time. So, Derek, you, you've heard don't poo poo plus right? Awesome yep. freaking content over here from Grant. And we got taken on a philosophical journey by Kevin. Uh, what say you, my friend, from the brand side? Well, before we go any further, I'm, I'm unconvinced. The more I listen to Grant is, can you just say for me, 25% off car insurance? <laughs> yeah, 25% five rates or less. Yeah. <laughs> it's uncanny. Really? Okay. He'll be giving autographs after the panel. <laughs> No, uh, I wasn't in Roger Rabbit either. <laughs> 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 uh, just bringing back a, a few of the topics that came up and, and Rob's comment about what some of the, uh, the, the Twitter comments were, but what is the role of the agency? In, and I think most of us have been through this with our significant other. It, it's where you tell your significant other the same thing. You should do this, you should do this, you should do this. And they ignore you, they don't listen to you. And then they come home one day and they go, oh, I'm going to do this. Well, why? Because the cashier down at the grocery store told me I should do it. And then you just want to beat your head against a wall. And, and that's the role that an agency plays, though, because you've got the internal politics, but when you get an outside expert or authority coming in and they say things, it has, their words have gravitas. They, they have power, they have meaning that is heard more so than you can do if you repeat it 100 times internally. So I think that's one of the roles that the agencies can absolutely bring is an outside objective view in, 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 into the piece. Um, as far as where does social belong, for the love of God, never give me a Facebook feed because my mind is completely DR. You know, I don't think it would go over well if I said buy mother, buy. Right? And that, that, that's fundamentally how I, how I conceive of things. And Facebook is a warmer and it's a fuzzier side of things. And traditionally, we are on the direct response side of the business. So I think that that side always does belong on the PR side. Um, I think that's the role that they play. Where PR falls down or, or struggles with often in, in many organizations that I've seen is they don't have the tools. If you think about the tools that we actually use on the DR side, whether it be search or whether it be um, custom audiences for Facebook. It's something that I've toyed with on my side of the business for direct response, but how can I use that? How can I use my email lists from this side of the business to create targeted lists on Facebook to create a great and highly active Facebook audience so that that feeds back into search? How can I use my tools that I use on a day-in, day-out basis to grow the base? 
So the responsibility, in my opinion, for the social media side of things, for growing the base and the strategic overall direction, actually belongs with e-commerce. So let's in, uh-oh. We've all struggled with this. So, uh, <laughs> whoo, touch and go there for a second. We're short on time. <laughs> um, so to finish up here, we'll go right down the line here. What's the future of this? Three years, five years from now, what's going to be, we're going to look back and we're going to say that was a fad or that was really kind of a, you know, significant change. We should have paid more attention to that and invested more time and energy into that. So where does this go, Kevin? I think, you know, we'll, we'll see something along the lines of, of influencer marketing, right? Basically this idea that there are these influencers that have a tremendous amount of pull on the SERP, but they also have a direct, tremendous amount of pull on consumers just um, because of the social graph. You know, I, I think that um, uh, one of the reasons why Google has uh, gone, has been as, uh, uh, that why they're as old as they are is because they really focus on relevance and I think you know that's going to be necessary in social as well uh, whoever's going to do it well and whoever's going to last uh, for at least five years really has to focus on relevance and contextual relevance uh, if they're going to um, get the hearts and minds of consumers I mean uh, we read it so many times that Google said mobile 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 I mean I think it's a matter of knowing where you are what you're doing and get that context from location and I think the socially aware future of search is going to be about knowing where you are, what you're doing. We talked about yesterday about when you're in your car and you're driving home and a car asks you if you're hungry and if you're hungry you say yeah and it says there's a restaurant around the corner, your favourite food, your Thai food and it's on special today and you can just stop off and do it or it's waiting for you when you get there. So I think ge uh, geo-based context to social will be the key thing and outreach is out here. So it'll be passive search, you know, pushing. It's not a fad. It's it's it's, it's absolutely there. I, I I'm thinking back to Copeland's uh, keynote yesterday, mm -hmm. where he, he did the survey. I think of a thousand people, and I think 79% of them wanted Facebook to be more like Google, or uh, I forget the exact numbers. But the reality is, people want this sort of interchange to happen, and ultimately come down to who does it well, because ultimately it comes down to context. Certain depends on your business, what you're trying to do, what the person is searching for and certain social media properties align better with it. So who ultimately does that job well will win the battle. But as search marketers, it is early stages. You need to follow the money. So my recommendation would be not to invest too heavily in it at this point and just see where it continues to develop. But probably within uh, two years, three years, somebody will get it right. Great. Any time for questions? I, I think we got most of them in during uh, the session off the tweet screen. So I, I think we're pretty good there. Right. All right, I want to thank my panelists. Nice job, guys. Give them Thanks, a round Siri. of applause.